Hello everyone, welcome to the Craft and Business of Books with me, Tatiana Denford. Marissa Hussey is not with us today, she is on maternity leave. So I will be covering the tools, the stumbling blocks and the tricks to the writing process, both from the creative side and I'll also be answering the publishing side and covering everything in between. We are on every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern, so make sure to click the link to subscribe below to be alerted ahead of every episode. So today we're talking about coming of age fiction, um, but with a little bit of a creative spin on it, it's going to be an own voice immigrant narrative. So, um, and I'm actually really curious to how the industry finds the particular magic in that kind of writing. Marissa and I are both uh, coming of age mm. fanatics. I mean, obviously with there's Jane Eyre, um, but then also there's The Girl's Guide to Hunting and Fishing by Melissa Bank. And also in um, recent years, the, one of the most successful ones was um, uh, The Goldfinch. So, and just to clarify for anybody who's watching right now, um, coming of age fiction is not young adult and it's not crossover as we've talked about in previous episodes. We are talking here about books written for the adult market that tell the story of a young child, a teenager, a recent college graduate, um, and it covers a broad range of years and takes us on a journey with the main character um, or characters from youth to later in life when they have some maturity. And they offer the author a chance for, you know, to the perspective is that you get to look at the character twice, both in youth and as they com come into their older self and everything in between. And I don't think personally that it's really common in commercial publishing um, because there's not, it's not necessarily a genre of its own and there's not one publisher that's known for coming of age fiction. So from Marissa's perspective, when we were talking about this the other day, she was saying that she's come across them occasionally in her career and they're really, really quite special. Um, and for me, from a creative perspective, I'm just really curious as to how a debut author manages to present a lot of things in one novel. Um, and we've never covered coming of age and this book and this author in particular manages to cover so many shades of coming of age. There is trauma, acceptance, a need for affection, and it's all cleverly woven together with such honesty and rawness and humor, um, which is a really hard thing to do. And I'm actually curious about it because I might want to try my hand at it one day. <laughs> so it's, maybe it's a bit selfish, um, but it's, uh, it's really fascinating. So. Let me introduce the author that we have uh, on today. Her name is Maria Kuznetsova. She is a native of Kiev, Ukraine, who moved to the United States when she was a child. Her debut novel, Oksana Behave, was published by Spiegel and Grau Random House in 2019, and it was a Barnes & Noble Discover pick, as well as a best spring read, according to Oprah Magazine, In Style, Pop Sugar, and The Wall Street Journal. Her fiction and nonfiction appears or is forthcoming in McSweeney's Quarterly Concern, The Southern Review, Guernica, The Three Penny Review, Crazy Horse, Slate Magazine, and lots of other places. She lives in Alabama, where she is an assistant professor of creative writing at Auburn University. And her second novel, as if she doesn't have enough on her plate, her second novel, Something Unbelievable, will be published by Random House in April 2021. She's also a fiction editor at the Bear Life Review, a journal of immigrant and refugee literature. So come on in, Maria. Hello. Hi. Thank you for having me. A absolutely. It's so exciting. And also it's because I'm Ukrainian, so, yeah. <laughs> so it's nice to have a Ukrainian author on here. So maybe I'm a little bit biased. Um, so... Okay, let's start with firstly, obviously um, you have a new book coming out. So I wanna know, especially during a year that's been a little bit crazy, how's that been going? Yeah, you know, um, I mean, it's been really nice to have something to look forward to. So uh, there hasn't been a lot of that this year. So I think it just, it's um, working. I mean, the book, you know, it's been in, like I haven't changed any words in it since early in the pandemic, but just kind of, having something to look forward to, copy editing, looking at the cover art, talking to my team, you know, um, I think that's helped me feeling hopeful and excited. 
Um, wow. but obviously, you know, it's not going to, I'm not planning a live tour or anything like that, you know, so, um, but I think, yeah, so, you know, <clears throat> as good as can be, I would say I'm excited about it, um, even though it's going to be different from the last book. That, I mean, uh, and that's great. And it's, we all need something <clears throat> over to both as readers and as creators, I think. So that's an accurate kind of description. And if, if you have thought like much farther ahead, do you see anything in the pipeline? Are you working on something that will be kind of after that or? Yeah, yeah. So I've been working on um, kind of a follow-up to my first book, Exana Behave, um, which is more um, that book, as you said, is more of a coming of age story that spans 20 years. And this new book spans kind of two years of early motherhood. Um, so wow. it's a little different. So, so we'll see. So I'm working on that. And then, um, for years now, like five or six years, I've been writing these kind of really short speculative kind of flash stories, um, that are quite different from anything else I write They're, I mean, they're, they're autobiographical in that they're interested in things that interest me, but they're, I don't know, they're very fun and different. They've been kind of an escape that I would turn to when I wanted to write something short and magical and weird. Um, but now I have, I'm approaching like two thirds, three quarters of a book of these. So I'm also kind of um, working on that project and they speak to each other a lot. So while one is autobiographical and one is weird, I think they're interested in a lot of the same yeah. existential concerns um, <laughs> and, and issues of motherhood, I guess I would call them so. Um, so we'll see. Yeah, I guess those are the things. <laughs> what do you think? You do you find that therapeutic to kind of dip into maybe smaller bits of writing? Yeah, definitely. And there, you know, I'm kind of my stories tend to be in the longer side and be a bit long-winded and descriptive. And these stories, like they're very, for me, minimalist and very voice-driven and very like punchy. And I try to keep them under like seven pages, which is like not anything I do in any of my other writing. So um, like in Exana, each chapter was like at least 20 pages long. So um, yeah, so I think something about the urgency and the brevity really is a nice antidote when I'm kind of stuck in a longer piece that I'm weeding through and I feel like yeah. there's no end. And um, yeah. yeah, and I, and I think there's a, there's, a, there's a trend to that actually, especially this year, uh, is that people are looking for more bite-sized literature. They're looking, because they're, they, they don't have the headspace, obviously, to kind of tackle anything too big. So mm -hmm. it's kind of, it's comforting to find something where you can kind of read and go, oh, that was nice, and then you move on, yeah. Mm -hmm. For sure, and, and I think kind of writing about something that doesn't take place in the real world has also been a nice escape. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all need a break from the real world. Um, so now, the, you know, with what, in, like, what gets you inspired to write? I mean, what, you know, and I think like we just kind of referenced a little bit of that kind of you needing an escape and kind of wanting something a little bit quicker and kind of um, more satisfying in an instant kind of gratification kind of way. But what, what makes you go, right, that's the, I'm going to write that down or, you know, any specific moments or just random? Yeah, I think, um, like I, I had kind of a weird upbringing. So a lot of my, I'm uh, not that weird, but you know, I came to America when I was almost six and um, we kind of moved around the country a lot. So I've lived in like um, the South, the North, the Midwest, the West. Uh, and so I think just out of living in so many different places, I've kind of had an interest in <clears throat> what makes people belong to a place and how do you belong somewhere when you don't really belong, you know? So I think, um, just issues or questions of place and home and all that kind of stuff um, is one thing that interests me. And then I think just the absurdity of life, you know, um, like if something happens where I'm like, that's hilarious. I wish I could tell someone in this moment, but I can't because, you know, I'm in some kind of formal setting where I can't text my friend and say that this weird thing happened. I think that's kind of what drives a lot of my, um, my writing is just a exploring that absurdity and embracing it and seeing seeing where it can go. So I think a lot of it is autobiographical, but also some of it is aspirational or like wondering what if. Um, yeah, what you could be or what you could be doing. Yeah, exactly. And then, so when you were writing Oksana, what made you, I mean, obviously having a colorful childhood is, <laughs> is helpful <laughs> for material. Um, and I know when I was, when I was writing my, novel and it was about 
you know, a lot of things that happened to my Baptist life. It's, you know, you have, it, you know, so rich, that kind of background. And I think, you know, and it's also quite unique having the Ukrainian experience where not many people know about Ukrainians or kind of, you know, so when you were writing it, did you think, did you, did you set out to go, right, I'm going to publish this or did you write it just for yourself? And what kind of made you take the leap to going, right, I'm going to submit it to agency? Yeah. So I, um, <clears throat> you know, I wasn't, I had kind of a long, boring writing history where I wrote, you know, two other, like I wrote one book about Chernobyl, which is actually with a white, uh, a young narrator. Um, and then it didn't get published. I had an agent, didn't work out. She worked for me for two years and then we didn't end up selling it. We basically parted ways. Um, mm -hmm. And then I worked on a different book uh, that was kind of a comic uh, 800 page, you know, 10 character perspective um, kind of story about a, a father and, a, and his and his daughter seeking fame uh, and feeling to find satisfaction. Um, and then on the side, I was kind of writing these stories about, um, you know, a young immigrant from Ukraine uh, coming of age and living in the different places where I lived. And they were kind of a side project. And then, um, when I went to graduate school and did my MFA, I kind of, at some point I was turning in these stories, to, I was working on this big novel and then I was turning in these stories to workshop. And then at toward the end of my first year, I thought, you know, I actually have a lot of these. Um, I had maybe half a book, but, I, but they're all different characters with different names and slightly different biographies. And I was like, this girl could just be that girl and this person, you know, it could be all the same narrator and there's nothing lost in, um, nothing would be lost in just making it one thing. So at some point um, I had started to work on both on that book and the big book. And then when I sent it out to agents, I kind of sent them both. And then um, most of them showed more interest in the Oksana book. So I think that's kind of, and they were too similar um, for me to pursue both. I think, you know, they were just too similar uh, yeah. in a lot of ways. And so like they had the same kind of set pieces and that blah, blah, blah. So I kind of went with the one that I couldn't let go of. Uh, and that was Oksana. So um, so that was kind of how that, that, which was kind of slightly unusual, but that was what happened. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, and it's so, you know, the characters are so irreverent, which is really, it's re really refreshing because there are so many very serious own voice immigrant kind of stories, which is, you know, obviously, you know, and it appeals to so many, but I appreciated that you just completely push the seams of, you know, any kind of assumption about what, <laughs> what an immigrant story could be, you know, and I, and I, you know, and I'm sure agents saw that and was, and were like, that's, that doesn't really exist. You know, it's, and it's, yeah, it was really refreshing. And do you think, do you, you know, with, with something unbelievable and then, and also your next kind of projects, do you think that that kind of, style that process that kind of writing down little stories that are then interwoven is that is that similar or did you change with something unbelievable did you change your process of how you started writing yeah i think that one is definitely um a more traditional novel in that there's like it's about um a 30 something actress who puts on a play based on her grandmother of World War II story. So it's, it's, in, it's like Oksana in that it's interested in this grandmother granddaughter relationship and inheritance and has a very comedic grandmother figure, but um, it definitely is more like novel like in that there's just two characters and alternates their point of views. And it's partly in the present, like kind of Manhattan area. And then the past World War II, um, girl mountains, you know, so um it definitely was different. It was based on a long story that I just expanded <laughs> and expanded yeah. and expanded. Um, and so it's not like the new Oksana book that I'm supposedly working on is, is the same kind of interwoven form of different chapters that stand alone. But this, yeah. uh, my new book, something unbelievable, I would say is more, it's the process was pretty yeah. different. And um, did, you, did you like this process better or worse, or was it just like a nice thing to try out? Yeah, I think it was, um, a nice, a nice break, you know, like I mixed, I'm mixing it up and it was good that the editing process was totally different. It was a lot harder because I um, couldn't just like add a chapter or take one out or, you know, work on these discrete parts. It was all kind of come, came together more. So if I got rid of something early on, it was harder to track it down later, you know? Um, 
but yeah, I enjoyed the process a lot and I enjoyed writing about something historical and kind of thinking, imagining my grandma's past, looking at old photos, doing research and not, and the actress character um, I would say is like pretty different from me, though maybe from a distance she seems similar in that she's an immigrant artist, but like her just kind of the way she acts and looks at the world um, is really different. So it just, it was a really nice break from yeah. uh, myself. Yeah, <laughs> That's a theme of escapism in your, <laughs> in your right. writing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and to speak to your kind of comic point, like um, I think what you said about Oksana is very spot on. Um, and, and the books that you mentioned, you know, so I, the immigrant books that I read growing up that I liked a lot, um, especially ones written by women, I found were more serious, you know, um, or took on a more, um, like Jhumpa Lahiri is one of my, like I absolutely adore everything she writes. Um, and she has slight, you know, like subtle humor in her books, but I think that the tone or Eun Lee, um, you know, or Edward Danticat, you know, the tones tend to be less baseline comic, which for, you know, for reasons of like subject matter and style. Um, and then and then something like um, The Girl's Guide to Hunting and Fishing, which is one of my favorite books. And uh, I, I teach a young narrator class for Catapult actually, and I always teach uh, advanced beginner uh, the first story in that book, which is amazing. Um, and then I saw a lot of, you know, humorous writing, um, not, you know, that wasn't necessarily immigrant based or was written by men like David Vizmoskis, that was funny, but I hadn't read like a ton, ton of female immigrant humor story. I mean, I know they exist, uh, but at the time it was kind of my way of making making my story my own. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, and, you know, Oksana is her own brand of feminism. Mm -hmm. you know? And, and, I, and I, I really like that because, you know, that word doesn't exist you know, within any kind of box. And I think, you know, this book really kind of manages, like I said before, to kind of push the boundaries of what people expect. And I, I, I just, I like books that make me feel and think something in a jarring way, but not in a, an aggressive, not in a negative way, you know? So, you know, and um, it's funny because uh, Marissa and I, uh, when we were talking about this book, she, she said there's something about... Oksana, that calls to mind, um, where'd you go, Bernadette? And she, you know, but but with an immigrant twist. And, you know, and she was saying that, like, she said, novels that tackle characters or plot points that are unlikable or out of context on the whole, you know, you can actually understand who she is within the novel. But if you take her out or a character that's like this, you might not like her very much. But the, whole, the within the story, it's really quite empowering. And I think, you know, I think the industry generally, you know, shouldn't be scared off by anything with sharp edges. Um, you know, and do you, do you, I, I was going to ask this question, like from the industry perspective, do you think the marketing copy or the jacket copy um, was written that was written about the book softens any edges that you were hoping that would be quite out there? Or are you happy with how they marketed it and how they presented it? Yeah, you know, I think um, at the time, like, yeah, I'm totally happy with, like, I think the, the copy is lovely and it makes it, it communicates like the humor of the book, um, some of like the plot points. Um, but I didn't really realize until like the book came out um, that it's kind of hard to describe the book because um, of just the way that it moves through time. I think, I think like the, the two things that maybe tripped up readers was the fact that it kind of, you know, moves through time with um, like Tom Parada's Bad, Bad Haircut, uh, one of my favorite books of all time. Uh, it, you know, the fact that the character got two years older in every chapter or whatever, I think that that's a little har harder to, to digest than I expected. Um, and I think har hard to put in copy or hard to advertise. Like, yeah, then she'll be 22 and, you know, I don't know. Um, and then like the likability thing or whatever that is, like, I don't really think I was just writing a character and then later I was like, oh, like some people have strong feelings about this narrator. You know? um, but, but I don't know what, I mean, I think that the cover with the middle finger and the Russian doll, which I wish I had a copy of my book from me, but um, I think that communicated a lot of her character. So perfect, it's so perfect. <laughs> yeah. 
that cover is just, it makes you laugh, but it's also like, who is this person? I have to read about her. <laughs> yeah, I loved it. So, um, so yeah, I think overall it did, and I, I don't know how it could have done it better if that, yeah. if that makes sense. Um, do you think, do you, in your experience kind of working with a team and kind of being in that world, and as a debut author, it must be really kind of strange and wonderful at the same time. And um, do you, did you feel any pressure at any point to choose a side for your book? So what I mean is, did you feel any pressure to make it more literary fiction or make it commercially viable? I mean, they shouldn't be at odds, but obviously you were creating something that in your heart kind of the story was there, but did they ever kind of make you move towards one side or the other? Because the industry tends to do that. Yeah. You know, I think, um, like one of the reasons I, I really liked my editor was um, that she, besides that she had a background in, in uh, Russian literature, uh, was that like she didn't really push me to make my narrator more likable, you know? And then when I was deciding between editors, I think, and I liked, you know, all the ones I talked to, I think that was part of the conversation with some of them. And I just wasn't like interested in that, you know, you know what I mean? Like, or, I, I would work on her character for reasons of making it, you know, better art. But I think when it came to, if it felt like it was more just because readers would like her more, you know, I don't know that that kind of um, that kind of thing I was resistant to. There was there was some because of like it started in third grade. One one thing that she did make me like, or we had a number of options of what to do. Um, one thing my editor made me aware of was like, if someone opens the book and they read like the first pages of the third grader, like they might not want to keep reading, you know? Um, and it might misrepresent the book, like, which I like, you know, I, and I think it is hard. I mean, there are really good books like, like Room with a five-year-old, you know, that yeah. young narrator the whole way through, but I think um, they have a very different flavor than what one, one might not then expect like a hookup college scene and, you know, <laughs> yeah, coming, coming up. Um, and so I just wrote, you know, then we discussed like different ways to let the reader know that this isn't a YA book or it's not a young narrator, that it's going to be a coming of age type thing. Um, and then I just wrote the prologue that was basically like, um, hey, just so you know, there is an older person looking back on this coming, you know, yeah. up ahead. So I think that was, um, yeah, so I think that was, I mean, there's always the pressure, right? People, they want, you know, the book to be sold and they want it to get to, the readers to know what's there, but also to make it, to appeal to a large audience. So, um, so yeah, I think that pressure is always there. And so the best you can do is find a team that under, like, understands that pressure, but also helps you envision your book the best you can. And I agree. I think the prologue helped. And like what she said made sense to me. Um, but since I wrote the book, I'm like, oh yeah, I know she gets older in a chapter and it's fine, but like, obviously someone at the store wouldn't know. So it didn't occur to me that that's something, um, to think about. Yeah. And yeah. I think not, not only you got really lucky with your team, it sounds like, but also I think you said something really important and for kind of people watching who are maybe new in the industry or want to tackle kind of write publishing a book is that you kind of have to feel like you're comfortable and have a voice to say to whoever you're working with, hang on a minute, but I see her in this way. And you want to make sure that at the granular level, that is still preserved. Mm -hmm. with whatever, with however they market the book, it has to be, Oksana couldn't be any different because if she was shades of something else or something milder, it just wouldn't be as irreverent and funny a book. And the story wouldn't be as Helen, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so tell me more about writing comic writing in long form. And like what what do you think it afforded you in the story of Oksana? So comic fiction can be such a, a powerful slow burn. Um, and did you did you set out to create that dynamic and to create such sharp witted characters or did it kind of evolve that way? Did you, I mean, like to be a bit more specific, when you were writing, did you know that you can kind of sharpen them a bit to make them comically like really compelling or did that just kind of happen because they're like that in real life? <laughs> yeah, I think um, it's a bit of both. So like, as I said, like I first wrote individual stories that um, then became the book. So like the first one I wrote, 
that that I would like call a good finish story was like Lightyear, which is not you know the funniest chapter of the book. It's the chapter where uh, Exxon's father passed away. Um, those are some funny moments. Um, but I think like the opening chapter where she's with the grandma and the grandma goes down prostitute street and people think she's a prostitute, but she thinks they're just hitting on her. Um, I think that's kind of somewhere around there the the tone of the the book emerged where it was like, all right, I'm just gonna go for it here. Like, let's see. And it gets, cause I think um, to me, maybe not to my parents, but like my, my family's like early years in America were kind of comedic, like, we had no idea what we were doing. Yeah. We'd never seen a palm tree before. My parents had never seen the ocean before. Like, what the hell is happening? Why are we in Florida after Ukraine? Like, that to me is, and my grandma's there trying to date men, you know. Um, I think it's like, it's inherently comedic. So I kind of embraced the situation. And then um, and then I found that like the characters, that's how they wanted to talk to each other. You know, they wanted to have like, da -da -da, like these kind of um, short barbs and that, that kind of just fit. Like I didn't, like before I'd written funny things, but I think they wasn't, baked into the DNA of the book yeah. the way that it was here. So, um, so yeah, I just, I just went, went with it. Um, I'm teaching a, a humor seminar in the spring for, for graduate students. And so I'm kind of thinking, like, I don't know that I have a lot of like sharp insights into humor, but I, I guess so, something I think about it is when people say like a book is good and they say, Oh, it's also funny. Like, I think, yeah. I don't think it's also funny. I think that, it's not like, oh, it also happens to be funny while being good. I think the funny is part of being good, you know? And, um, and so I'm trying to think about like what, what having some funny moments versus like being like aggressively comic, kind of what that does. And I think it just fit the story I wanted to tell. I don't think it'll be like something like my new novel, um, the, the one of the central grandmother characters, I think she's inherently comedic, but I think the story is, it doesn't read as comic, it reads like, a funny story, if that makes sense. It's not baked into the tone. I think the way that people think about the world and communicate um, is, is, is humorous and fun, but I wouldn't call it like comic. Yeah, I think, you know, I think there you can't ever, it's like with acting, you can't ever try to write humor. You can't ever try and act funny because it's never going to be funny. And I think there's, with Oksana, I think to me, Partly what made it funny is because I have had these experiences with my own family. And it's, my grandmother was really funny, but it was accidental. Like she was, you know, and she, I mean, she would elbow people out of the way in the grocery store and have a thick, like she could barely speak English. She'd elbow them out of the way because she wanted to like get something in their shopping cart. I'm like, Bob, you can't do that. You know, it's, it's funny. I think there's an element of, with Oksana, the way it was presented, I think the humor is based on a little bit of sadness mm -hmm. and awkwardness with that immigrant experience. And I think that to me resonated. And I think to a lot of people, they find that combination really surprising with an immigrant story, sadness together and the awkwardness of them st standing in a new country going, I don't know what the hell this is. <laughs> really funny it's in a really strange way it's perverse kind of but yes i know exactly what you mean if you tried to paint that scene in a comedic way without like describing the characters as somehow awkward and sad it just wouldn't it wouldn't work no yeah it's, it's kind of, um now do you what did your family, what did your family think of this when you, when you were like, right, I'm going to publish these stories. They're like, hang on a minute. Yeah. You know, I think um, they were proud that I finally published a book. So that was good. Uh, and, and I think over like, yeah, they were, they're good sports um, as, as much as they could be, you know, that now they're a little more, um, if they say something, they're really like before the, the joke was like, don't put that in a book. But like now they really mean it. Like now it's not when they say it, it's not really a joke. I'm like, OK, I'm not going to write about your third cousin and his second wife's grandson's, you know, whatever dog. I don't know. You know, uh, but but but, you know, they're right to say it. So I think they're definitely excited for me. And they're good sports. I think they're excited that the next book will not um, <laughs> be it will be about my grandmother and less like focused on them so yeah so we'll see uh, yeah <laughs> you know with like all of this writing and teaching and you have so much on your plate 
But if if I'm going to start asking you really hard questions now, sure, I, sure. I, I, I this is the end of the show when this is like kind of really interesting questions. I think um, if you could do anything uh, instead of this, what would you be doing? It's a good question. You know, I've been doing this for so long that I I, I didn't like I never had. Um, like a real other thing that I wanted to do. I know it sounds pretty crazy, but um, you know, I like art, like I'm not good at it at all. Um, but when I was a kid, I was really into it. I mean, I guess that's a cop out cause it's still a form of, like I like drawing stuff and painting. Um, I was slightly above average as a kid, you know? And then I stopped and now that I have a two year old, I'm kind of making these art projects with her. Um, and it's just really fun and like not, um, I'm not thinking about like hanging up the art in a museum, you know, I'm just making it to throw it out later. And I just, I don't know, something about that is is really freeing. So I thought like, I don't know, maybe an art teacher of some sort or teaching Aww. children. Um, but yeah, I don't know. But I'm, I just like, I like doing stuff that I'm aggressively not good at. Cause I think it really is fun and challenges me and like, doesn't feel serious the way that writing does in a lot of ways. The one thing with that would be fun in a different way. There was actually a quote I read the other day. Uh, I, I wish I'd remember who'd said it, but I think it was a writer that said, um, it's always good to try something you're terrible at. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think it really kind of activates a, a different part of our brains to kind of do something that makes us feel a little bit vulnerable. And that's probably, I just wonder if that's kind of the, the buttons that you're pushing a little bit, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Cause it's just like, there's no, there's no stakes, but I could actually get better and that would be fun too. But it would like, I have no goal. I have no goal to ever like sell a piece of art. Cause I'm not, like, I, I don't know. I just enjoy. Like, you can always you know, add some of your doodles to the kind of the pages of the next book. You can always <laughs> I could do that. Those could be limited edition, right? Uh, so. <laughs> I know Kurt Vonnegut. I don't think you'll see any illustrated uh, parts of my books. But no. <laughs> um, so um, the other question I have is, is there something that you could share about yourself or your writing process that people would be surprised to, to know? Um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, I don't know, like what, what would be surprising, I think, um, is just how much bad stuff I write for a good page. I don't know if that's a huge surprise, but I think, um, for every like finished 20 page story, I probably have three to 500 bad pages, you know? And I think, um, even if it's like, the Xana stories, which I feel like I have more, um, more of a read on because I've written them before. It's still just anything you see that maybe seems like it was easy to write or like effortless jokes or dialogue or whatever. Um, there's just a lot, a lot of bad, bad writing underneath it that I would never ever show anybody. Um, this to me is a really, really great point because I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with people who are writing, who are going like, oh, oh this is really bad. Like I'm just, you know, everybody else is so much better. And no one, no published author, or very rarely do they kind of lift the veil and go, actually, look at all this crap that I have sitting on my desk, or look at how many thousands of words I've had to delete before my book was even published. So this is hugely important. And I think people would be actually really interested to know that. You know, yeah. Like, the, fin the finished product will not exist had you not had a ridiculous amount of slush to get through. Yeah. yeah. And there's, you know, there's stories. I mean, some of the Xana stories, they came pretty fast to me and I wrote them in graduate school and then I revised them. But there's a few in there that um, I wrote, you know, almost eight, like I, I did a master's program out of undergrad and then I took like a bunch of years off and then I went back to an MFA. And I think there's a story in there, the one, um, what did it become, private property. Uh, yeah, basically I wrote a version of that story and the light year story like in graduate school. And like they, I turned in like, hor like I even, now as exercise, I read like the first scene of the original version and then the current one, like to show, um, you know, what revision can do. And it, it, they're both like completely different. And the first one's like horrible and yet like, if you wade through the 10 extra like plot points 
and characters and not funny lines I put in there. Like the actual story is buried in there. Like it's, it's like a sculpture, you know, it's definitely yeah. in there. And like, I, I got it out, but it, it, it took a lot of excavation, I guess. Um, yeah, and, and that's the kind of stuff that, that um, Marissa and I really like talking to authors about because it's not, it's, there's a little bit of secrecy, not on purpose, but the industry doesn't talk about that. They give you a shiny thing and you're like, wow, that's amazing. And you know, there's so many people win awards and everything looks so perfect, but what you don't see is the process to get there. So that, that to me, even though to you, you're like, oh, look at this, so that, that yeah. to us is really exciting. Yeah. yeah, no, I find it exciting too. And I think when I'm stuck, I, you know, just go back to old things and, and take a look and say, God, this is awful. Like, and I made this into something. So maybe I, you know, there's hope for me in the future. Um, but yeah. yeah, it takes a lot. And I think, you know, people have different processes. Like I have friends who they'll write like a perfect paragraph, but it'll take them a week. And for me, I'll write, like, I write really, really fast. I can, you know, I don't have a problem generating a word count, but generating good words is, is where I, you know. Yeah. And that's the thing. And word count doesn't necessarily matter. You could write 500 amazing ones or, you know, 5,000, awful ones and everybody kind of does it their own way but that that whatever count that is as long as you're kind of making something that you're happy with you shouldn't you know compare it to anybody else's um yeah so that's really good the other kind of similar so when you know um i wanted to ask you like when it comes to the publishing um industry um, and being in that world is there anything that you would change if you could snap your fingers and not necessarily something that's broken or wrong, but something that would work better for you as a writer being in that world. Yeah. I mean, I think for sure, I wish that there was, and it, it didn't come from my team, but I think, you know, just in general, like the pressure to write likable female characters, I, I feel like um, that, when men do it, they, especially Russian men, you know, no one says, I wish your narrator was more likable, you know, um, I wish, uh, you know, Negan was more likable, whatever, right? Um, but I, I do feel like with stories about women, um, even if they're like funny or quirky or offbeat, like, uh, you know, um, and where'd you go Bernadette, you know, there's still yeah. like, in the end, this, this desire, I think, and I don't know if it's coming from the readers or the industry or both, but I think, um, yeah, I just women, I wish women had more of a chance to um, to be offbeat and to not have like the book deliver such, you know, a neat little message in the end about what something means. Like I think with my book, everyone, or not everyone, but I think certain readers who read a certain type of book might have expected um, like a final happy ending where Oksana comes yeah. to her senses and- I love the end, because it's, so, it's, it's her. Like it, ha it has to, that ending has to be the way it is. I think everyone is, well, not everyone, but so many people are conditioned to consume things that have a, a Hollywood ending, I call it. You know, it's just, it, that's not life. And I like something that kind of ends and makes you go, hang on a minute. You know, and it makes you just stop and digest exactly what you've just read rather than, oh, yay, and everything's done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I think, you know, the, the way I saw it, and my second book has, kind of ending like that too. Uh, like life is gonna keep going for the characters even if it's not going for the reader, like the readers aren't getting to be with them anymore. So I didn't, like life doesn't end in your mid thirties if you're lucky, you know? So I didn't want it to be like, oh cool, I figured it out now, goodbye forever. I want it to be like, she's maybe on the way, but like there's more ahead and that to me yeah. felt um, maybe less Hollywood-like, but more more true to the character and the book I was yeah. trying to write, so. Um, and I think I think I think you're right, and it's such a great point. And I think nowadays, more and more, I really I I think I don't know if Marissa was here, she'd probably have a bit more insight. I think the industry is more amenable, slowly to kind of having like conflicted female characters, and I think it just creates conversation, it creates dialogue. And I think it's really, you know, if we were all perfect and tidy, it'd be really boring. So why not present characters the same way? I completely agree. Um, and final question is, stuck on a deserted island. Oh no. One book, what would it be? One book, oh gosh. Um, I didn't prepare for this. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, one book. Um, you know, Girl's Guide to Hunting and Fishing, Bad Haircut, um, those are all really good. Sergei Zavlatov is really good, you know, um, but his books are so short. So um, I don't know if I'd want a really short book. Um, I would say I would I would take like five of his books and call them one. Is that is that cheating? Wrap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tape. Yeah. I think they're all you know like I would take the suitcase ours, Pushkin Hills, the compromise, and glue them together and call it one book. I know that's cheating. No, that's good. And I expect that somebody, an author like you, who would write a character like Oksana, Oksana would say the same thing. Yes, I'm she, cheating. She managed to <laughs> cloud the rules a little bit and go, yeah. no, actually, I'm going to do it my way. <laughs> That's how I would do it if you accept that answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, this has been so lovely. Maria, honestly, like, I'm, I'm so pleased that we managed to get a hold of you because of your <laughs> schedule. So, and I'm super excited to see what's next. Yeah. Thank um, you. Where can people find you? Um, you can find me on my website, mariacousinsova.com. And um, on Twitter, I'm at Masha Writes. And I think those are the, the two main places they could find me. Um, find my book, Something Unbelievable, on my publisher site. It's out in April. And uh, this is kind of my first time sort of talking about the new project. So, because um, we're a few months out. So thanks for having me here talking about both my books. It's been really it's fun. It's been so much fun. Okay. All right. Bye. Well, um, and that's it for me. Um, again, it's been a really fantastic discussion with another incredible author. And, and I really think um, today the process of writing coming-of-age fiction kind of went in a lot of directions, which I really enjoyed. I think it it offered us a really valuable perspective, both from the creative side and a little bit from the industry side. And then from somebody who just keeps writing in a really irreverent way. Her Maria, Maria's process is just really interesting. And I think it also shows people who are writing a book and want to publish a book, that it doesn't have to be a certain way. It doesn't have to be cookie cutter. Your story, you just have to believe in your story um, and everybody else will believe in it with you. So anyway, thanks very much for watching The Craft and Business of Books. We are on every Friday, 2 p.m. Eastern. Click the link to subscribe and be alerted of every show. Um, it's been great having you here.